Uh, welcome, everyone, those who arrived uh, during the sit. Um, so actually, I'd like to just hear from people um, about the, what came up for you in relation to your body, particularly that first instruction to reflect on your own on your relationship with your body and then your relationship to your mind. <laughs> starting point, because we're start. So uh, just to frame the day a little bit, we're starting with self, right? <laughs> Which is where loving kindness practice starts with our relationship to ourself. Because how are we going to love people if there's how are we going to love others if there isn't some care and kindness towards ourselves? And then we'll work outward <laughs> to others. So I don't want you to think this is all about like me, but that's kind of the starting point. So just interested to hear if anything came up for people or if there were any thoughts or comments. And of course, people online are also welcome to, to chime in. I'm, I'm going to try to watch the chat and then uh, uh, Rob will you know, pass on anything that I miss. Somehow get it out here. So you were all just sitting in complete peace and calm, and there were no difficulties or challenges. Yeah. I have. Uh huh. The microphone. Thank you. I have. Well, you had... might as well say your name as long as we're at it. Yes, my name's Jim. Hi, Jim. And um, I've had some some problems with my eyes, and uh, it occurred to me as we were meditating that I wear glasses to improve my farsight mm -hmm. because I'm naturally nearsighted, mm -hmm. and that uh, I can use meditation to develop my insight. Very good. And uh, it's a little bit like developing and polishing that new pair of glasses that looks inside mm -hmm. and and looking for that insight. And with that in mind, as I was listening to what you said, it occurred to me that my body tends to absorb stress mm -hmm. and I can um, sometimes project that on other people. Mm -hmm. and your comment about replacing that with love and kindness and then using that same way of projecting right. to project the love and acceptance and compassion is really, to me, a worthy insight. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, great, thank you, yeah. Others? Really? Just kind of interested to hear. I know stuff came up. I mean, uh, un unless you're just, you know. My name is Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Um, so nice to be here and to meet you and see everyone. Um, I, I just recognized, I guess, I, I was having some knee issues while we were sitting here. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I'm not very kind to myself when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, but then we've been out, you know, recently and climbing around and hiking, and I, I was able to do what I wanted to for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And I was able to be more um, physical and active. Yeah. And I was quite happy with my body at All that right. time. <laughs> Good. So, I mean, it, it comes and goes. Yeah. And Indeed. the awareness that my attitude is is movable yeah. <laughs> and um i mean i guess i always knew that but to to really recognize it as something that i should pay more attention to um and just kind of work with that yeah. so that that's Great. what was going on with me thank you i like yeah oh good good other people volunteering <laughs> yeah you gonna... It's your ice cream cone. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciated what you said What's about. Your name? Oh, I'm sorry. My name's Amy. Amy, yeah. hi. Hey. Um, I appreciated um, what you said about the body being susceptible to you know, that. That's what the body does. Yeah. Gets ill. Yeah. Gets sick. Um, is tired. Is injured. Is. 
And um, I would think that on one level, but I recognize that. But somehow in this moment when we were sitting with it, I had this insight of, oh, no, I actually do expect it <laughs> to be um, always. To yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, and I get quite irritable and upset with it when there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And that's not what I would have thought I was doing, but in the moment I really saw it, so thanks. Yeah. You know, it brings to mind one of the really classic in the second sutta that the Buddha gave, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, which is the sutta on not self. The first thing he says is, form is not self, for, meaning your body. Your body is not you. For if your body were you, you would be able to tell it to do what you wanted it to do and to look the way you wanted it to look and to you know, act the way you wanted it to act. And it's like one of the starting teachings on not self. It's like, oh, I don't have control of this thing that I think is me. Well, if it's me, why can't I control it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Karen. They can't hear us. You online. Try the other microphone. I'm Karen, and um, I had a, an interesting experience um, looking at my body. I, I um, am a very, I'm a very active person, and I, I run and I cycle, and I've always kind of relied on my body to be able to do what I want it to do. But I also have digestive issues. So what the experience I had when you were guiding us was this kind of a an odd mosaic of feelings that, you know, my, a feeling of gratitude to my body for being strong and healthy. But then when I focused kind of on the center of my body, I felt um, this pleasure <laughs> of some sort yeah. with, you know, that core part of my body. So I um, found myself trying to come up with a more neutral experience, you know, sort of, the unpleasant and the pleasant um, neutralizing each other, but it didn't really work. So anyway, that's, that's all. Well, it's a, it's a work in progress, as we say, <laughs> trying to sort it out. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, what came up as I was talking about this was, was how through our lives, our relationship changes so much to our body. You know, when, when you're young, you want to be older, right? You want to be bigger and stronger and faster and all these things. And then, particularly, you know, adolescents in your 20s, it's like you want to just look as good as possible. Like, that's the main thing, like, right? And, and eventually you're like, well, that's over. <laughs> so now, then it gets to be just like, I just want to be able to do the stuff I want to be able to do. And, and, and seeing, of course, that like, Eventually, it just all is going to go away, and it, you know, and how how we relate to that, because uh, you know, it's one of the ways that we cling to our lives and and cling to these different these different aspects of it. But at the at the end of the day, we cling to the the life itself, which is and, and that as you get old, not just older, but as you get old, and then it's like, wow, okay, this is like not not a joke anymore like this is just going to stop at one point <laughs> anyway I, i'm always full of happy thoughts so you know you other uh, any other comments uh, i appreciate all of that um i think that you know to me that covered a few of the things that i sort of wanted to see you know about you know, bring out, um, and and so I want to I want to move in now to more the mental realm and how we think about ourselves. So uh, anyone who arrived late, there's some handouts up here. If you didn't get a handout, please come up and grab one. And partly that's my effort to make you come up here. <laughs> Because I could get up and hand it out to you, but this is more fun. So, 
So this is, uh, and, and so uh, as I, I mentioned to, uh, oh, I've got, there's more of these. I have a pile of them. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, this is kind of building from and working with ideas that are in my book, Living Kindness. And I, I mentioned that what, you know, the kind of primary goal of the book was to kind of expand people's understanding of, of what loving kindness means and the, and the, the four Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Which, by the way, I went through in that meditation, in case you didn't notice. I, I, when I listen to a guided meditation, I usually space out and don't hear most of what's being said. So if, if you're like me, you know, I understand. So I'll try to repeat things. But, but a, a secondary purpose to my writing this book was to try to bring some of the suttas of the Pali Canon to people in ways that would intrigue them and, and uh, partly to get them to want to be studying this Pali Canon and the suttas and, and partly to just appreciate, oh, there's, these suttas are not just dusty old, you know, t teachings that, that uh, no longer have any relevance. So the um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the suttas themselves. So this this particular collection I'm holding is called the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, or in Pali it's the Samyutta Nikaya, and it's got chapters that have that are thematic, and so and there are a lot of smaller suttas, um, but they'll they'll all be connected. That's the title, the Connected Discourses. So this chapter. Is called the Kosala Samyutta, the connected discourses with the Kosalan. And Ko Kosala was a little country or principality in northeast India at the time of the Buddha, and it was a place he spent a lot of time. Now, as you pr probably know, the Buddha came from a kind of royal family in the Sakya country. I, I, they're, they were so small, it's hard to call them countries. But um, but at the time, of course, without a lot of transportation and communication, that you, know, you didn't need a big uh, uh, you know area to to qualify, I suppose. In any case, the, so the Buddha had this you know princely background, and so he winds up. It's very interesting. He winds up having relationships with many of the kings of the other countries that he would travel through, and I think that. It's kind of striking and interesting. I find that interesting because it's not just that he's walking around and talking to, as he does, talks to common people, but, but that he also has these relationships. And you can imagine that it was easy for him to connect with them because that was his background too, right? So for him to walk into a situation with the king or the queen or a prince, was, he wouldn't be intimidated by that. He'd, he'd, he'd fit in. So the, the Kosalan, which is uh, that's referred to here, the person from Kosala, is King Pasanadi, who was a follower of the Buddha. And so this whole set of suttas involves conversations with him. And his so King Pasanadi was a follower of the Buddha, but his wife was a devotee of the Buddha. He had many wives, or several wives at least, but the one that the only one we really know about, Malika was a real devotee of the Buddha. So there's certain tensions we see in that. Like when your wife is like really into the Dharma teacher and you just kind of like the Dharma teacher and then you're kind of like, you know, uh, I know you really like, but what about me, you know? <laughs> so there, we'll get to a sutta where that comes up. But this first one I want to talk about is the one that, that's called deer that's in the, it's the first one on this. I believe it's the first one for you here. And it's very short. And so I'm, I'm just going to read it. Um, 
because they're certain, partly to sort of give you the flavor of the suttas, and, and you have it in front of you, most of it in front of you. I think you might have the whole thing. So, at Savati, so, <laughs> I, many of the suttas begin, thus have I heard, which is the voice of Ananda, the Buddha's uh, attendant for 20, the last 25 years of his life, who recited many of these teachings at the first council after the Buddha died. So this whole, this whole section starts with thus have I heard, but because many of the suttas are very short, it doesn't give that full introduction. But as we often see in the suttas, we are at least told where we are and who's, in, who's there. So at Savati, sitting to one side, King Pasanadi of Kosala said to the blessed one, so again, I'm sorry, I'll be stopping like every other line. I don't know why this is, but if you read the suttas, you see that whoever is addressing the Buddha, if they have any respect for him, is sitting to one side. So it, it clearly there was something about, just you didn't just sit right in front, like walk up and go, hey, like I want to say something. You always sat to one side. I've, I've never seen any scholarly reference to what that, why that is, but it's, it happens so often that clearly it means something. You know, which, and, and pretty clearly it's about respect, right? Okay, so he says to the Buddha, here called the Blessed One, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus, who now treat themselves as dear and who treat themselves as a foe? Which is actually a good question, you know. Who treats them, because this is the question we're starting with today, right? Who treats themselves as dear or who treats themselves as a foe? It occurred to me those who engage in misconduct of body, speech, and mind treat themselves as a foe. Even though they may say we regard ourselves as dear, still they treat themselves as a foe. For what reason? Because of their own accord, they act toward themselves in the same way that a foe might act towards themselves. I'm sorry, I'm looking away and looking back. That, that a foe might act towards a foe. <laughs> Therefore, they treat themselves as a foe. But those who engage in good conduct of body, speech, and mind treat themselves as dear. Even though they may say we regard ourselves as a foe, still they treat themselves as dear. For what reason? Because of their own accord, they act toward themselves in the same way that a dear person might act towards one who is dear. Therefore, they treat themselves as dear. So, what I love about this sutta is that it's not saying that we, that we are... Um, have to qualify, and this is kind of a, a core idea for me, that we have to qualify or deserve to be loved by being special. But that the key thing is that we engage in good conduct of body, speech, and mind. That that's what makes us worthy. That and, and by good conduct, what he's talking about really is the precepts, right? He's talking about not killing, stealing, lying, harming sexually, or using intoxicants. He's not talking about like becoming rich or famous or winning some prize, you know, all the things that we sort of, or being good looking, you know, and all the things that we sort of prize in society that get, Oh, uh, you know, we feel less than, right? Oh, I'm not really. But uh, here it's like, just, you know, what, what makes you dear is, is that you live wisely with integrity. And so, uh, and it, I think it's particularly interesting that he says, even though they may say we regard ourselves as a foe, even though you have like, these negative thoughts about yourself, even if you think, oh, I'm kind of a loser, if you're actually taking care, if you're actually acting skillfully, you're, you are 
treating yourself with love, with as a dear person. Yeah. We don't e- we don't e- necessarily even see that we're being that we're dear. Hi, yes, I was just wondering about the part where a person might say, we regard ourselves as a foe. Why would you say, I regard myself as a foe? So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange turn of phrase, but what it's saying is you don't like yourself. You think you're not a worthy person. But That's how I understand it. But if you're behaving, if you are conducting yourself appropriately. Right. Then you're not really a bad person. I, I'm putting it in these sort of modern terms, in terms of how people, of people with self-esteem, low self-esteem and self-hatred, that's what I think it's about. Is it about like self-hatred? Like, oh God, me, you know, I'm such an idiot. You know, that's like, a foe, a foe, right? Being view yourself as a foe, as a loser. Uh, I'm sure it could be interpreted differently, but that's how I get it. Other other people have thoughts. So so let me go to the the next sutta, which is the one. This one is in my book, and it's called Malika. So as I said, she's the the devotee of the Buddha. And there's a little bit of a backstory with Malika that I like, which is that she was actually just a poor flower girl. And supposedly, uh, King Pasnati was like riding through the city with his entourage. And he sees her and he's struck by her. And there's different accounts of whether she was... I've read two different accounts. That One, that she wasn't actually physically that attractive, but that there was, because of her great devotion to the Buddha, she had a magnetism. But then I've read other accounts that said she wasn't physically attractive, so I don't know. But I like the first one, that she was just magnetic. You know. In any case, he sees her, and he stops his chariot, like... I need to buy some flowers from this <laughs> this woman, and then he eventually, you know, and but but she's this great follower of the Buddha, and and that's why he's really drawn to her. And then he, he brings her, you know, to the palace and makes her one of his wives. I believe the number one wife. <laughs> uh, you know, there are issues there, but you know, we can't sort them out. Um, but, they, but we often get these conversations between the two of them. So, so there's another uh, conversation they have later uh, or that I will bring up later in the day. But this is a very short one, and, and I'll read you the whole, the whole sutta. Again, at Savati. So Savati is the capital of Kosala. Now, on that occasion, King Pasanadi of Kosala had gone together with Queen Malika to the upper terrace of the palace. Sounds like a nice place, really, the upper terrace. Then King Pasnadi of Kosla said to Queen Malika, Is there, Malika, anyone more dear to you than yourself? Now, when you, when you read that, and you put yourself in the, in the place of Queen Malika, and the king says to you, Is there anyone more dear to you than yourself? You might feel a little bit of pressure, you know. And, and indeed, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's the translator of this collection, I've listened to some talks he's given, uh, uh, taking apart some of these teachings. He says, King Pasanadi was fishing for a compliment. He was expecting her to say, oh, you are more dear to me than myself. Queen Malika, though, is very wise and has a lot of integrity. She says, there is no one, great king, more dear to me than myself. But is there anyone, great king, more dear to you than yourself? So I love that she, not only is she honest, but she puts it back on him. So let's see what he's going to say. Well, like, 
Okay, he's not going to now say, oh, no, you're more dear to me, because it's like, well, I already lost this conversation. So I, For me too, Malika, there is no one more dear than myself. Then King Pasanati of Kosla descended from the palace and approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One, sat down to one side, <laughs> and related to the Blessed One his conversation with Queen Malika. Then the Blessed One, having understood the meaning of this, on that occasion recited this verse. Now it takes another turn. Having traversed all quarters with the mind, one finds none anywhere dearer than oneself. Likewise, each person holds himself most dear. Hence, one who loves themselves should not harm others. So, the Buddha teaches this, turns this just personal reflection into the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. One, per, one who loves themselves should not harm others because you know that each person holds themselves most dear. When you realize, well, everybody cares about themselves in the same way I care about myself. You know, it's one of those things that you wake up to at a certain point in your life. You, I don't know if you, you know, you've all had that moment where you realize, in my mind, the world revolves around me. But every person that I see in the street, every person I encounter, their whole world revolves around them. It's such a weird thing to realize, right? It's like, wow, it's like all this consciousness is going around feeling like the middle of it. And, the, and every consciousness is the center of that consciousness ex experience. But let's go back to the initial point here. When Malika says, there is no one more dear to me than myself. And this goes, goes back to this question. And again, we encounter this in our culture so much, this idea of self-hatred and that we have to, so we've got this whole practice called self-compassion, right? Trying to teach people how to be kind to themselves. And, but what I take away from this it, 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 it took me into reflection on the meaning of the word love. That there's this idea that loving yourself, in, in, in some ways, in a culture that kind of values a certain kind of public, at least, humility, somewhat values it, seems like we're losing that, but that there's something wrong with if you say something good about yourself, that that's like ego, right? And so, and so, but that humility, which, you know, has, you know, there's a, obviously, a, you know, a, a positive quality to humility, but when it turns into self-judgment and self-hatred even, and self-criticism, that it starts to turn into something destructive and so we, we start to, we have this like, uh, I think what, what people do is that we have a standard by which we are measuring ourselves. And it's basically unattainable, right? So we set up a standard that we can't live up to and then we compare ourselves to that. And so we say we're not worthy in some way. And it might not be self-hatred, but it's like, yeah, you know, I'm not one of the good ones or whatever. And what I've come to, my view on this is that that's not really important what I think about myself. What's important is how, if I take care of myself, <laughs> that love is care, is caring for someone. It's not a, an a emotional outpouring. And you know, we know, I mean, obviously romantic love is this remote emotional outpouring that lasts for a little while and then it passes. And, but we, that's what we kind of call love in our culture. And it, love has to be this sort of 
the overblown kind of emotionality and and passion that doesn't really res- necessarily result in something beneficial. I mean, we we know it's it's not uncommon for people who say they love someone to to abuse them, to harm them, to kill them. You know, you know, obsession, right? But somehow we put that under a category of love. Whereas what I think love is is caring for ourselves, which in traditional Buddhist terms starts with sila, starts with morality, starts with good conduct, right? Of, of the previous sutta, good and you know, good behavior, good speech, you know, um, skillful thought, wise thought. So it's not like living up to some standard that, like, do I love myself or not? Well, the question I ask isn't, like, what do I think about myself? It's how do I treat myself? Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a rec- I identify as a recovering alcoholic, and I can see that even though I didn't think really any less of myself when I was drinking and using than I do now, Maybe to some extent. But, but the critical thing was not the thinking. It was the behavior. It was how I harmed myself. Yeah. And, and of course, we know this in our relationships, in our family. The way we show love, it, you know, it doesn't ma- matter how many times you say, I love you, I love you, I love you. What I want to know is, are you going to show up and take me to the doctor? You know, are you going to show up and are you going to make me some breakfast? Are you going to clean the kitchen? When, you know, when it, are you going to take the garbage out? You know, are you going to do those things that show care for me and for our, our family you know, and our community and how do we care for each other? So that's what I think uh, that, that Malika is talking about. She's, I don't think she's saying like, oh yeah, I love myself because I'm so pretty and I'm, you know, no, it's not, it's not about that uh, that she you know she thinks she's special it's that she cares for herself so that's uh <laughs> i i get a little wound up around this thing cuz i th- i find it it's in some ways it it's a difficult idea to communicate my understanding of this cuz it it kind of doesn't fit with our ideas uh, in in our culture of what love means and and what self-love means you know that because we know that self-love can also what we call self-love can appear as narcissism right and that's not really love right that's that's an unhealthy ego an egotism you know care self-care also implies care of others because we can't just take care of ourselves you know if i'm just taking care of me and not looking at my family my friends my country my world then it's going to wind up being selfish and it's not going to be actual self-care it's going to be more like narcissism or solipsism I think for me this is a really important reflection because I have many failings and I, 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 do, I, do, I make mistakes, uh, shortcomings. And if I walk around with an attitude like, oh, you know, I'm such a loser because I did that or I did that or I had that thought or, you know, or I said that, oh, then... I just am, again, the second arrow. I'm just creating more suffering for myself. Rather than saying, oh, I'm a human being, therefore I fail. Therefore I make mistakes. And I'm going to take care of myself, and I'm going to obviously try not to make mistakes. I'll try to improve. Of course, I'm trying to grow. But, you know, let me not create more suffering for myself by setting up some ideal of what I should live up to. So um, maybe just to see if there are any thoughts um, 
on that whole uh, that sutta and on that reflection. Uh, tell us your name. Yeah, uh, my name is Raghu. Hi, Raghu. Uh, the, the thought that came across for me was that uh, the act of loving, of actually doing something nice or helpful, cleaning the dishes, whatever, is different from the conceptualization yeah. of I am good. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, you know, you're your mental construct is kind of, you know, creating that layer of uh, interference. Yep. And that those are two dif different things. Yep. I think it's so important to see so that we don't let the thoughts then plunge us into you know, unwholesome states un and that are going to lead then to unwholesome behavior, but rather to just see, oh yeah, that's a thought, just like we do when we're meditating. Oh, I'm just thinking. And there's nothing wrong with me for having unhelpful thoughts. It's just what my, uh, my mind does, you know. Um, I, my dear late friend Wes Nisker had a great line, he said, your mind has a mind of its own. <laughs> right? Again, like your body. It, it, is this my mind? If, if this were my mind, it would not behave the way it does. You know? and, and so we, it, we, this is why the teachings are so important. There's teachings on, on kindness, on acceptance, equanimity, forgiveness. Oh, this is just the mind doing what it does. I am going to continue to take this next skillful action and, and thank, as we say in AA, thanks for sharing, you know, but, you know, because if I, if I, like when I wake up in the morning, I, I don't have good, I'm not a morning person, let's just put it that way. When I wake up, I'm like, why bother? That's kind of my attitude. Like, what's the point of even getting out of bed? Like, the, never mind. But, you know, because I'm dear to myself, I get up and I go through the motions and then my mind changes. My body, my feeling of my body changes at all, right? I, I remember, oh yeah, everything is impermanent and I need to take right action and then I will create the karmic results which are I will feel better. <laughs> and I'll go meditate and I'll be like, hey, what was I bothered by when I woke up this morning. And I just realize, right, it's just the mind. The mind and body, they're just going through what they're going through and, and uh, having the Dharma as these guiding principles, uh, uh, you know, just uh, keeps you on track, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually, this, the thought that struck me here was, uh, you know, your mental construct about your behavior uh, the labeling, which is kind of an aggregate, and and that feeds into other thoughts, the mental formations, and it kind of goes in a circular loop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's why you know the the tools, the meditative tools, are so important. Right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, so that we can interrupt that loop. And, you know, we, we do that in a formal way when we're in sitting meditation, but we try to then bring that guidance and those principles into our lives so that when we find ourselves in the midst of a, that papancha, that, that proliferation, that we can stop and just go, okay, no, let me start again. Like, where am I? What am I feeling? What is this thought? What's the next right thing? What's right view in this moment? Um, it, and that's, I mean, it, you know, right view, right intention. It, we really have to 
cultivate these qualities uh, because our you know the the term the Buddha uses the unenlightened worldling you know as unenlightened worldlings our mind just has you know they they want to go in this direction of you know greed hatred and delusion they want to grasp after it wants to grasp after things it wants to get away from anything unpleasant you know and and we have to continuously be interrupting that it's it's not as if like oh you meditate and you, know, you go on a retreat or you read some dharma and then you're like okay good i got it figured out it's like your mind still has a mind of its own you know it just will keep will keep going uh, that flow that karmic flow is so deeply conditioned it's one one of the reasons why i think forgiveness and self compassion is so important to just to understand that 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 conditioning that human conditioning goes back millions of years that is driving us towards grasping i mean it you know it's quite a a paradox of the buddhist teachings that the things that allow us to survive are the things that also cause us suffering and 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 how we how we hold that <laughs> paradox then is what uh, really creates the potential for letting go of the suffering or transforming that but it's a continual process because that conditioning doesn't you're not going to uproot millions of years of conditioning just by you know your own self will Uh, so, so the challenge I have there is you, you mentioned about right intention, and, uh, and I've been reading about dependent origination, and I come to the conclusion that your intention is again uh, an effect of a, a cause, right? It's it's also conditioned. Your intention is also conditioned. Right. That's right. So is that kind of going back to the raft uh, thing? You know, you have to cling on to something to get across to the other side. Right. It's a... I mean, it's a little like a whack-a-mole, I guess, you know, that <laughs> that the the... You know, we have this conditioning, and then we have this decision, let's say, to try to follow the Dharma. We take refuge in the Dharma. And part of that then, that, that then sets in motion a process of, let's say, the Eightfold Path. But the person who is engaging as you're, I think this is what you're getting at. The person who's engaging in this eightfold path is the is the one who is already going in the wrong direction, <laughs> and so we're uh, the you know we we are trying to heal ourselves even though we are inherently flawed. And how how do we do that? And you know, as a friend of mine who who. Uh, told the IRS that he had only made $1,500 for, for a year, said to the IRS, you, how do you survive on $1,500 a year? He said, very carefully. And, and that's, what, that's this process. It's a very careful process in which there's a very, we try to pay close attention to all the things that are undermining our effort to to move skillfully. And, and so this is why we cultivate these qualities, why we cultivate mindfulness. Because without mindfulness, you can't have right intention. Without mindfulness, you can't have right effort. So mindfulness has to be there, examining all along and questioning all along. Is this in harmony with the Dharma? Is this skillful? 
and, and, and so, I mean, that's why having some understanding of the teachings is, is so important. It's, it's really hard to do this without guidance, whether it's a teacher or the teachings themselves, that we can measure ourselves against and ask those questions and, and, and as you're suggesting too, reflect on these things, reflect on impermanence, reflect on not-self, reflect on, how, on the Four Noble Truths, and, and keep examining it. And, uh, I mean, it's interesting, you know, that there's, I think it's easy to fall into this trap of thinking, oh, in order to really be a good Buddhist, I have to attain some level of perfection. No. But, and, and, and along with that, like one of the versions of that is I have to clean up all my karma. But that's why the Angulimala Sutta is so helpful. You see this mass murderer who has a breakthrough in consciousness and becomes enlightened. And there's no way he can make up for all the harm he's done in his life. And, and he does, he continues to bear some, people treat him very badly, but he att attains enlightenment. And what we realize is that we don't have to be perfect to have that breakthrough in consciousness. We don't have to be perfect to become enlightened. You know? Now, wh what that means and how that looks, you know, uh, I, I don't know. But, but I, I think it, it's a mistake for us to sort of view ourselves as always, oh, well, there's, there's so many, uh, you know, potholes and, and so many traps on this path that I'm never going to be able to get there wherever it is I think I'm going. Uh, but rather to just say, uh, I'm on this path I'm doing the best I can. I don't know how this is going to unfold or, or how to make it. I don't even know how to make it unfold. All I know is that I trust in the Dharma and that I'm trying to live in harmony with the Dharma. And what comes out of that is out of my control. And I, and I just need to let go at that point. So I, I don't know if I'm if there was a question or if I'm answering a question. <laughs> but I think we should take a little break because we've been sitting here for a while. So let's take uh, 15 minutes for bio break and stretch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.